Okay, here we go again with another episode of Randall Reports. We're going to do our third one and wrap up the paper on the Torrid Complex smoking gun. Uh, we about got to the conclusions last time. We're going to keep these brief, and uh, we should be able to wrap this up in uh, short order. Uh, I want to remind everybody to keep up on these events because Randall is writing up uh, – Summaries also on his monthly newsletter that comes out the first Saturday of every month. So you can find that directly on the website, randallcarlson.com slash newsletter and uh, many more items in there and just keep you up on the tours that we've got coming up and all the events and uh, new additions to the website coming soon also to keep you up on, on what we're up to. Welcome Randall. We're going to do it again. Well, thank you, Brad. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll come back to this uh, background here, this backdrop, because it uh, it's a modification of a cometary photograph, I believe, Hale Bop, that I did years ago um, to try to suggest a possible scenario. And I still think that this might actually fit the criteria. So... Jumping right into the smoking gun paper that's featured prominently on the um, uh, Cosmic Tusk website. We were going through some of the conclusions last time when we uh, when we wrapped up, and uh, you know the conclusion was is they looked at these light curves from these objects, right? So objects that were are they asteroids? Are they comets? Are they hybrids? Are they something in between? So these light curves can reveal a lot of information about the structure and composition of these. And, um, so we, um, so they, they looked at these light curves and saw that there was varied composition, but many of the 140 objects that they looked at seemed to be cometary in nature. And the other thing was 88 of those 140 bodies that they looked at uh, studying the orbital characteristics, which are um, sort of summarized uh, by this, what they call the D criterion, which is D criterion is sim simply a measure of the orbital similarity of these objects. So that's what they were looking for. They were looking for, do these orbits uh, relate to each other? Uh, at some, in some way that by regressing the orbits, you can basically see that they um, were generated from the fragmentation of a single progenitor object. And in this case, the majority of these objects that they looked at did satisfy that D criterion, which means that they probably could be regressed back and to be a, sing a single object, which fragmented, um, you know, some thousands of years ago. Then they also pointed out, as we said last time, an interesting member of the Torrid Complex seems to be the Tunguska asteroid, which we'll do a, uh, a couple of reports on that coming up at some point, because uh, there's been some interesting studies that have come out, not anything super recent, but still things that, uh, you know, new, new developments over the last few years. Oh, yeah, okay. Then they point out that uh, in addition to larger objects, macroscopic objects, there's a lot of microscopic stuff um, the torrid complex consists of a uh, a component of microscopic objects, microscopic material made up of small particles that group in streams um, and give rise to meteoric showers. So, uh, you know, the torrid showers, we've just passed through the torrid shower and we are now uh, in the latter stages of the um, Leonid shower, which peaks on around the 17th and 18th or a couple of days ago. So then it says that the, the, the microscopic component is important because it constitutes the entire, the part of the entire system that interacts with uh, the most frequently with the Earth. And in the early stages of a cometary fragmentation event, some of that dust material could be very significant because if it accretes to the Earth, it can affect the opacity of the atmosphere, which then in turn affects the, uh, the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth. And so just the dust alone can, 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 can contribute to uh, a cooling of the climate. Um, and then, of course, when that dust fraction clears out, it would appear as a warming of the climate, depending on how long that that dust remains in the atmosphere. Or it may, it, it, it generally would clear out within a, a year or two, but if it's something that the Earth is encountering on a 
annual or, or, or biannual basis, then it could be that as fast as that dust component is cleared out, it's replenished. You see, so it could be that the climatic effects could be much more prolonged than a single dusting of the planet. Since meteor showers are in the vast majority of cases associated with comets, either active, quiescent, or extinct, um, they demonstrate uh, that, the, that the small component of the complex has an overall clear cometary origin. So they've looked at the larger objects and the, da the dust and, and found that it seems to be consistent with um, this. The two previous results give support to the idea that the Torrid complex was originated by the multiple fragmentation of a comet and a celestial catastrophe that they're dating to about 20,000 years ago. And for that date, they are uh, referencing uh, Victor Klub and Bill Napier. Uh, they point out that... Um, that Hephaestos, which is, I think, generally considered to be an asteroid, and uh, 169P-NEAT, N-E-A-T, are also members of the Torrid Complex, and they have their own subgroup. Um, so then uh, they go on in their conclusion, and this is re really where we left off, after they integrated backwards from the size of 2P Anki and found the diameter of the parent body at the time of the first fragmentation, um, somewhere around 20,000 years ago to be greater than 28 kilometers, which isn't that big, you know, but when they looked at the, the dust component and realized that there was an enormous amount of dust, uh, when they included the hat, they come up with a diameter of, of 120 kilometers. So, you know, that'd be about 72 miles. So that's a hell of a big object. Um, and then they make, uh, then they show that in their studies of these light curves and the composition um, from what, from their figure nine, and I'm going to do a share screen here just so we can show that figure nine. You can see right here, let's zoom in a little bit. So this is your Gaussian curve, which is the blue curve here. And these outliers outside of that show that there's a disparate composition that there's um, right down here. It says that it shows that the distribution is not homogeneous with outliers beyond the Gaussian fit. So what this is showing is that there's a number of different compositions at work here. There's not just a single object with a single composition. It's a, the term is heterogeneous. So, this was one of the, the primary criticisms levied at the, um, at the giant, at the, uh, uh, younger Dryas impact hypothesis was the, that it seemed like the proxies were kind of spread out all over the place, just in a way, like you see right here, you see, and they're going, Oh, wait a second. If these, these are all these different, this widespread distribution of this material, it's not a single object. So, you know, this was one of the criticisms. But what this study is showing is that, um, that yes, it was a, uh, a very heterogeneous object. They go on to say here, um, it's clearly indicated by the figure we just looked at, the Torrid complex harbors objects of different compositions and spectral classes. This, this situation can be explained by a rubble pile texture. Let me, let me read that again so we don't lose. This situation can be explained by a rubble pile texture of the ancestor of the Torrid complex, which, moreover, due to its intrinsic fragility, is a structure more susceptible to episodes of fragmentation than a compact structure. Um, in particular, this composite structure can be explained why can explain why some Torrid complex members like Oljato show a cometary activity and so an important ice content coupled with a mostly rocky superficial composition as suggested by their spectral type. Um, so in fact, the recurrent increase in brightness during the perihelion or closest to the sun passages of such rocky, rocky objects suggests the presence inside them of ice, which in proximity to the sun sublimates and escapes from the body through superficial fractures. So then, I'm going to do another share screen to show an example of, uh, so you can, to help people visualize what we're talking about here. We'll call this a typical, as they say here, a, hal a, ha a Halley type comet nucleus. 
And you'll notice here that there are these volatiles discharge, being shown discharging from fractures within the, within the crust. But if you look, do a cutaway and look at the inside of this object, you see it's composed of, you know, much disparate kind of uh, varied material. And so if a nucleus like this begins to fragment, um, basically what it's doing, I, I've always kind of likened this to like a, almost like a multi-warhead missile. And as this object begins to fragment, it produces a major meteor stream. Now, uh, uh, Halley's nucleus is about 10 miles in diameter. So if we imagine this is 10 miles in diameter, then these objects inside here that could be released could be ranging from anywhere from microscopic up to, you know, several kilometers in diameter.